ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Well, welcome to today's episode of Need I Say Mer, the Christmas podcast. And today, my special guest is Martin Pearson. Hello, Martin. Well, good afternoon. It's very exciting to have you. Uh, do you want to quickly introduce yourself, who you are, what you're doing? Yes, certainly. My, um, I am pastor at Stroud Christian Fellowship. Uh, we're a small, uh, relatively small congregation, Stroud at the uh, the edge of the Cotswolds and the heart of the, the wool trade market town of Stroud. That sounds like a very nice part of the country to live in. It's very beautiful. Very beautiful. You ought to come visit sometime. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. And you're very welcome in Bridge End one day. Uh, well, thank which, you. Uh, it's also a very beautiful part of the country in South Wales. So yeah. there we are. And how long have you been there as pastor? So um, Strap Christian Fellowship was the church that I got saved into in 1981. Oh, wow. Amazing. And uh, having done almost every job in the church, about 24 years ago, I was asked to become the pastor, and I've been pastor for the last 24 years. That's quite quite a long time. So you've seen a, a lot of Christmases in the church then? I've seen an awful lot of Christmas. A lot of Christmas sermons, how do you do the same thing a different way? Yes. Yeah. I, I, do you have any wisdom on that? Uh, I'm only on my, how many Christmases? My seventh Christmas, I think. So I'm <laughs> way to go to catch up with you. Just pray about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed at how creative God is at producing the same same story, different ways each time, and uh, and we make it relevant for the for the audience that we've got as well. And and your your Twitter name is Grandad Martin, so you That's are correct. a very proud granddad. Uh, how many grandchildren? Uh, I have got uh, five currently. There's we've recently heard there's a sixth on the way, so that will be. Th- Three in New Zealand and three in the United Kingdom in Oxfordshire. Oh, what wonderful! Yes, uh, yes, exciting to have another one on the way as well. Yes, and I, I imagine that that kind of affects your thoughts on Christmas. What, what's it like celebrating Christmas as a granddad? Oh, it's wonderful! It's <laughs> wonderful because sure, yes. um, I know people say this about being a grandparent. You can give them back, <laughs> but, but no, it's. I've got I've got a story I'm going to end with about what uh, grandchildren have meant to me on last Christmas, particularly when the the children in New Zealand and the children in England got to have their sort of first Zoom call where they could communicate with each other. So I'll tell you that at the end. I'll, okay, I'll save that for a bit later. Yeah. But yeah. Christmas with grandkids is about just living in the moment and being you know everything is now and. What I've loved is because both my my boys have grown up and they're they're involved in the church and they're going on in their faith. But for the kids, it's not just, oh, what are the presents? We're celebrating Jesus's birthday. And that brings that dynamic which grounds Christmas in this is about Jesus. Um, And it's just amazing. Their simple faith, you know, uh, uh, where are they? They're at five and four and three and uh, one and and a six-year-old now. Um, that that simple faith that says we love this, we want to celebrate Jesus' birthday, and one of them one of them insists on having a birthday cake for Jesus because uh, that's what you do, isn't it, on a birthday party? Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful, and, and yeah, we can learn a lot from seeing how children kind of act out their their faith and absolutely, um, yeah. Sometimes yeah. Uh, coming back to just basic simple truths that we need to keep remembering. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. And we've we've got some questions for this podcast. I'm asking every guest that comes on so we go through these questions and, okay and see what your thoughts are starting with what is your favorite festive food item that one is easy okay and, and it's either christmas tea or boxing day it's the leftover sandwich <laughs> it's a cold fresh bread with with butter and cold turkey and bread sauce and cranberry sauce and stuffing all squashed into one sandwich just can't beat it. I'd have that over the main meal any day. <laughs> so for you, like the, the Christmas dinner is just a a, a way of getting the, the main meal, which is yes. the leftovers. Yes. There I we mean, go. Christmas dinner is about having the family all around one table and, and you know it's great. Mm-hmm. But the, the even better is you get to tea time or you get and you can then have it cold in a sandwich. Yeah. With a well, bit of pork pie, Adam. A bit of pork pie, yes. That that's always good. I always like a guest on this podcast who mentions pork pies. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have thoughts on festive pork pies. Maybe I'll share those in one episode at some point. But uh, yes, it's yes. Uh, leftovers, always good. And next question, what is your favourite non-religious Christmas song? Well, 
It's interesting. It's it's a been a favourite for me since it was released. It was released in 1975, which was before I came to faith, mm-hmm. and it was a favourite then. And it's a favourite now, but for different reasons. Okay, so, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So um, in 1975, it didn't make number one. It was stopped from being number one because there was a group called Queen with a record called Be- Bohemian Rhapsody that took the number okay. one slot. Never heard um, of it. Yeah. No, it, it's an odd one. But, <laughs> uh, but number two was I Believe in Father Christmas by Greg Lake. Okay, right. <laughs> which is, it's got everything about Christmas in there. And it's it's full of... There's a sleigh bells and there's um, there's tr- the the troika portion of Prokiev's uh, Lieutenant Key Ke- Suite and there's uh, imagery of a Father Christmas and tinsel and fire and the Christmas tree smell. But then there's this um, one and and that's why I loved it in 1975 because it was just so christmasy everything was great but then there's this line uh, line in the second verse that talks about um they sold me a dream they sold me a silent light they sold me a fairy story um and i looked to the skies with excited eyes then i woke with a yawn in the first light of dawn and i saw him through his disguise talking about father christmas and it's uh later on greg lake when interviewed about this said so it was really a protest about the commercialization of Christmas. Okay. That Christmas with all this stuff and you is really just a disguise because if you look into it, it was empty. And yet I think for for us, what we've got at the heart of our Christmas isn't empty. Mm. And so we've got to make sure that when we're presenting it, we're not presenting something empty, but we can still have all the glitter and the glitter and we can still have all that fantastic element of something magical for christmas but we've got something solid at the heart of it yeah and we don't have to look through a disguise we've got the reality at the heart and that's that's why i loved it in 1975 and i love it now and it still gives me goosebumps when i hear it oh that's that's wonderful yes yeah and remember that we we yeah we do have that real substance uh yes of, of knowing jesus at christmas uh next question go on Le- least favorite christmas decoration so my son now who lives in New Zealand is incredibly skilled and gifted as a creator. He, he What he can produce is phenomenal. But when he was at primary school, maybe not so much so. And he made this wooden articulated model, which is supposed to be Santa's workshop. And you turn the handle and different bits go up and down and it turns okay. presents around. But it's quite large. It's very unstable. It's garish um, and it doesn't work properly. (laughs) But even though he is still now he's 30 odd years old and lives in New Zealand, we still have to have it on display. (laughs) There's an expectation that this particular decoration will be on display. And I think you know that that's part of we want to celebrate our kids. But I feel like saying, you know, you've grown up now, boy. (laughs) So that's my least favourite okay. individual decoration. It will still have to come out this year. It will still have to come year. out, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I imagine quite a few of our listeners probably have their own stories of decorations that they have to get out because of various family obligations. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. There we go. And we do welcome correspondence on this podcast. So if anyone wants to write in with any examples of yeah, of similar stories to Martin's, of uh, items that they'll be getting out this Christmas, um, because they're children or grandchildren, that'd be great. I think um, you need to have a photo competition, and uh... we, we 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 should do yes, yeah, definitely. Send in your photos, and we'll do some kind of photo competition, and uh, the the prize will be uh, we'll come with an with a, an even worse Christmas decoration than all of those, <laughs> and you'll get to win the worst ever Christmas decoration. We'll go for that. Um, yes. Good idea. Uh, so there's the official. Uh, competition for this podcast um so that that's great so so we've talked a bit about yes. different uh different fun bits of christmas but as you've already mentioned for us uh as christians and as pastors what we're really excited about about christmas more than all of those things is that story of the the child who's born and i wonder as you as you prepare for your uh how many christmases you've you've been <laughs> yes. preaching now uh who is your favorite person in the nativity account well with the obvious exception of jesus who we yes, all say, because that's the standard answer yes um, i am 
the more I, I think about it, the more impressed I am with the person of Joseph. Joseph, okay. the the man that doesn't feature in too many Christmas songs, the man who doesn't really make an entrance on the nativity apart from maybe because it helps produce an extra character to play in the school play. Yes. Um, he is he's the one that acts with courage and with faithfulness. He's the one who, when Mary, because as you're probably well familiar, as listeners will know, you know, in that culture to be engaged was as good as to be married. And therefore for her Mary to suddenly be with child, the result would have been stoning. It would have been death. And yet Joseph decides uh, to quietly dismiss her. But then there's an intervention with an angel and he, he marries her. And later on, he listens and takes hold of what the angel has said. And he names this baby Jesus. Here's a guy who, you know, to all intents and purpose, um, has been ridiculed in the community. His engaged wife, who he hasn't had sex with, is with child. But still he stands by her. Still he stands by because God has spoken to him. And later on, you, know, you hear the dream. Uh, he, he hears the dream and he... he you know, goes into Egypt and comes back a different way. It's Joseph is a man who barely features in the narrative and yet would have had such an impact on the early life of Jesus as well. You can imagine him, can't you, teaching him in the in the workshop. You can imagine him saying, no, not this way. You're just gently guiding him. And yet by the time you get to the, the first miracle, the wedding at Cana, he's not even mentioned the likelihood is probably he's died by this point, but he is just this incredible, faithful character that brings strength into a family who would have been in inc incredible turmoil. You think of them as refugees, nowhere to stay, all this kerfuffle going on in an occupied territory, and he brings stability and strength. And I think if we as pastors, as leaders, whatever, if we've got a job to do, it's to do that for our congregations. It's to be yeah. people of faithfulness, maturity, and just gently in the background, bring some security. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yes. Thank you. And you said you were going to end with a, a story. Yeah. So uh, we were all ga gathered in the in the living room here. My my son and daughter-in-law and the, the two English grandchildren were here in our lounge and it was Christmas Eve. And the fire was going and they'd put out a glass of something alcoholic for Father Christmas to drink. And there was a mince pie on the plate and there was a carrot ready for Rudolph. And before they went off to bed, we managed to have a Zoom call with the New Zealand family. And my, my as, as she was at that time, five-year-old granddaughter said, oh, we're getting ready because because Father Christmas is going to, Father Christmas is going. And the reply from New Zealand was, what do you mean he's going to come? He's already been. Look, here's the mince pie that's half eaten. Here's the carrot that's been half eaten. And because of obviously the time delay, yes, Father yeah. Christmas has already been. And it was just that sense that we too live in a world where Jesus has been, uh -huh. is, yeah. but he is to come. And in that moment of living out the who was and is and is to come, the kids' excitement of being in that moment, all three of those, Jesus who has already been. He's come and visited us. And we can look back and look at his teachings. Jesus, who is with us now, but also Jesus, who is to come. Yeah, amen. That's a, a great place to end our, our chat on. And I suspect you may have given a few preachers who are listening a, an illustration for one of their Christmas sermons. Well, uh, half it on me. There we go. <laughs> hey, thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for your, your answers. And I hope you have a very happy Christmas. Thank you. And to you, Adam. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas.